Gordon. I'm with the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Over 200 organizations, private sector organizations that work to advise the Congressional Internet Caucus and Congress on Internet policy and technology. This is the first of our series of wireless um, panel discussions this year um, in cooperation with the Wireless Task Force, which is chaired by Congressman Mike Honda and Congresswoman Jennifer Dunn. I want to welcome you today. Um, we have an, uh, an astute panel. Uh, which will soon be esteemed. Uh, we have a great moderator. Um, and I interestingly, everybody up here today is um, named, first name starts with a J, so it's going to get very confusing. We have two Johns, a Jim, and a Josh, but we also have Mike Honda, so that'll, but it's in the same section of the alphabet. I want you to, just a, a housekeeping message. Next week, we have uh, another event um, next Thursday. A week from today, same time, at the Reserve Office Association up in the Hill, um, we have an event on voiceover internet protocol and law enforcement access, wiretapping, et cetera. So that one, the, your invitation was on the way in, so please put that on your calendar. Um, but in the meantime, I want to introduce you to the task force chair for uh, the private sector, Mr. John Camp from Wiley, Ryan, and Fielding. Uh, John has worked for years and years at the Federal, Trade Com Federal Communications Commission, at the Federal Trade Commission, and just about everywhere else in between. Um, he has helped us um, put together this event, and uh, I want to introduce him so he can introduce everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. This is going to be neat. We're going to spend about an hour uh, figuring out what wireless is going to be like uh, 20 years from now. And if we can get that done, uh, we can walk on water, too. Um, my first job is actually my favorite job uh, when I come to the Hill, and that's introducing Congressman Mike Honda. Uh, although he's only in his second term uh, at the, uh, in the House uh, from Silicon Valley, um, I find him more than just a good congressman, and I suggest that uh, those of you who uh, are interested in these things go to the website and take a look at his resume. Uh, I find him essentially the epitome uh, the, of the American dream. Uh, this is a fellow, the only fellow in this room, I think, whose hair is almost as white as mine. Uh, he got part of that because uh, he spent much of his, his uh, uh, very young life in uh, the Japanese internment camps of World War II, perhaps one of the saddest uh, uh, pieces of American history. Uh, from there, he uh, went to San Jose, where he uh, got himself through school, um, became a teacher and acted as a teacher uh, for some time, uh, later worked his way into the County Board of Supervisors there uh, after some teacher positions, uh, and is now uh, a member of Congress. It, it demonstrates uh, to all of us, I think, from no matter what party we are, uh, that good old-fashioned hard work can uh, take you a long ways no matter uh, what America might throw at you. Congressman Honda, thanks for being our, our chair. Well, good afternoon. Thank all of you for being here. Um, two Johns, Josh and a Jim. Huh? All Jays. Well, I'm a Japanese American. There's a J. <laughs> And they say there's at least two Johns in a house, so um, we're on our way. <laughs> I want to thank the panelists for being here, and I, I know that they've taken out their personal time to be here to share their information and their knowledge. And as co-chair of the Internet Caucus as a wireless task force, I'd like to personally welcome all of you today to, to today's panel discussion, during which you, along with the panelists, will be uh, challenged to contemplate the nature of the wireless uh, internet 10 to 15 years from now. You know, wireless access to the internet is becoming increasingly ubiquitous, especially with the increasing popularity of uh, Wi-Fi hotspots. You've been hearing that. Less than three weeks ago, for example, Open Park, a Washington, D.C.-based uh, nonprofit organization, launched the new wireless internet park on the National Mall here for users of uh, Wi-Fi-enabled computers and handhelds. In offering uh, free wireless internet access, Open Park has begun the process of making free public access to the internet a reality. A mere 109 years ago, after the first wireless signal was sent, and 27 years after the first cellular systems were introduced to Washington, D.C. So by the standards of Capitol Hill, we're right on schedule, I guess. 
A hundred years ago, visions of a publicly uh, accessible wireless communication must have seemed like science fiction. But today we can play chess against someone in Russia with our hi-fi enabled laptop while receiving business faxes on our cell phone while enjoying all of this sitting in the sun on the steps of the Capitol. Now that we have realized an initial set of goals for wireless communications, it is incumbent upon policymakers like ourselves to establish a new vision for the future of wireless communication, a vision that builds upon uh, the perspective gained from the past 20 years of revolutionary wireless innovation. What applications of wireless technology can we envision and what capabilities do we want to see integrated into the products that we use today? What goals can we set for ourselves in order to satisfy these needs? And in this venue, it is especially important to consider how the federal government can be a partner and advocate for technological innovation. These are all important questions and will be, focus, will be the focus of today's panel. As always, let me thank the staff of the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, particularly uh, Tim Lorden and Megan Kennard, and as well as all the member companies that provide critical support for events like this one. And I know that today's uh, discussion will be educational and valuable, and I thank all of you for coming. There was a question about my wristwatch. Um, it looked like it's high-tech, wi you know, Wi-Fi. Actually, it's just an old calculator, you know, Casio. But someday, we'll, we'll have convergence of all this technology so that we can carry it around like this and talk to our phone and not look too crazy in the bar. Okay, so you're on your way, and uh, enjoy yourselves. And again, to the panelists, we want to thank you. Again, thank you very much, Congressman Honda. So uh, one of the things I want you to start doing and thinking about the questions you want to ask. Here's how we're going to do this. Uh, we have three, I think, preeminent, uh, superb panelists. I'm going to learn a whole lot, I know. They're each going to go five to ten minutes on an opening statement, and then you get to ask them a bunch of questions. Actually, you get to ask them a bunch of questions through me, for the most part. But I want you to start thinking about your questions now, start scribbling them down, uh, have uh, Megan or someone hand them to me, uh, and we'll get them to you as quickly as possible. So, you know, what are we all about? Uh, this thing is called Wi-Fi or sci-fi, realities, uh, barriers, and boundaries. And that's exactly what we're going to try and do. When I was first told, us, told about what we were going to do here and what the, uh, the, the two congressional uh, uh, heads of the, the caucus uh, said, they, they told me that what we were supposed to do is talk about uh, what wireless was going to look like five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years out. And my response was, who's smoking something up on the hill? How in the devil are we going to do that? Well, I, you know, we might even be able to do some of that. I thought a good way for us to think about it would be for us to just look back and see how far we've come and how we might have gotten there or some of the ways in which we've gotten there. Uh, a quick personal story that I think that you will understand. Twenty years ago, I was the message, message carrier. I think I had some kind of title like legislative uh, uh, support staff for the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. I was the guy who came up here and got all your questions from your constituent letters that you, had, you couldn't figure out how to answer and went back to the commission to try to help you answer them. Uh, I did a couple of other messages back and forth from the hell, scars on my back from both sides, whichever one I was leaving. But one of those days, that when, uh, uh, when I was doing that, uh, Chairman Fowler said, and I want you to do this, take this message up real quickly. I think the guy's name was Dingle I was taking it to. And he said, take my car. And I said, fine. He said, it's really cool because it's got a phone. And it had a phone in it because the chairman of the FCC, as part of his defense responsibilities with Spectrum and stuff, had this phone. And I thought, hey, that's really cool. Uh, and it was cool. You know, there must have been some government reason for me to do this. But, you know, the first person I called, even, you know, barely out of the parking lot of the FCC, was my wife and say, hey, I'm, I'm in a car calling you. Who? 20 years ago. It was really cool. But what happened very quickly after that is I never wanted to go to the Hill if the chairman was using his car. Because I always wanted to go back and forth to the Hill in the chairman's car because the phone increased my productivity. 
I could essentially get the people at the FCC working on your crazy constituent questions on the way to the FCC when I was there so that they would be working on them even before I got there. I was able to answer your other calls to me that had come in, that, no voicemail then, that my secretary would tell me that we had to do. That is one of the amazing things about this wireless technology. The little things that made me more efficient as a government service are making us all incredibly more efficient or tethered but more efficient than we ever were before. Uh, productivity is one of, I think, the major things that's going on. It's also interesting to know that not long after that, the FCC created cellular phones, which started this, which was one of the major explosions that started this process. It also did pass another uh, item from the engineering department of the FCC at the same time that was, in fact, as revolutionary, but almost completely unknown, and we'll be talking about those kinds of actions today. That is the action that allowed for unlicensed devices that operated at very low power to, um, it exploded that uh, capability by making more spectrum available for those unlicensed devices. There were a few garage door openers back then in 1984, but just a few. And there were no such thing as uh, every one of your key rings, I bet, today has on it a little device uh, that if it doesn't help you find you, your car, it, opens, it unlocks the car for you before you get there. I also want to just now, let's just go think about 10 years ago. 10 years ago, uh, 1994, 95, we were two years away from the Telecommunications Act. We were also two years away uh, our, our, we, were, we were at, this, at the time that Netscape invented the first web browser. You know, many of you are perhaps were in grade school then, but the web browser revolutionized our ability, especially for those who, of us who weren't computer nerds and understood code, to actually find things on the web if we had access to it because we were working in the government or we were working uh, through a university. It also is sort of interesting to think about it. Jerry Yang and David Filo were still at Stanford University. Actually, they were about to take leave from Stanford University uh, because they were, they, were, they were having such a kick out of this internet thing that they decided to start a little company called Yahoo before they went back and finished graduate school. It's interesting, too, that two years later, I was in a meeting at the Federal Trade Commission talking about kids' privacy and how important kids' privacy was to all of us. And the woman who represented Yahoo, in fact, Yahooligans, which was the children's pages on Yahoo, stood up in that meeting and said something that today seems incredible. It was even a little incredible at the time. She said, you know, we hadn't even thought about children's privacy over at Yahoo, but you tell us what to do and we'll probably do that. And that's what they did. But that's only 10 years ago that the question of privacy on the Internet was even sort of around and available. So with that, I'm going to leave you with just two thoughts. Uh, if you haven't been to the New America Foundation uh, website, you ought to go there because they've done some awfully good research in this area. If you haven't been to the Federal Communications Commission website, you should go there, especially where the advisory committee on wireless, through the, and you can find it uh, through the Wireless Bureau, the advisory committee on wireless, doing some things that really are very important. One of the things, though, that was said there that I find really very interesting uh, and I suspect that maybe we'll be in the same position uh, or our grandchildren will be in the same position that we are now. Think about wireless. We're talking about wireless as the absence of something. When we talk about wireless today, I would ask you to think about, are we essentially talking about the same kind of things that our great-grandparents thought about when they talked about this great new invention, the horseless carriage? We're defining this thing in terms of what it's not. Arthur C. Clarke one time said that in any emerging technology, for those who are not the technologist, everything about it seems like magic. 
We know it's not magic, but it seems like magic. But the kinds of things that it can do for us in our economy are absolutely amazing. And these guys are going to tell us what it's all about. Um, we're going to start with uh, John Holdy, who is the Chief Technology Officer for Wireless at Nortel ne Networks. Uh, he's been Chief Te Technology Officer there for about 15 years. He, or he's been at Nortel for about 15 years for the last uh, couple, and has spent most of his career there on wireless issues, including uh, uh, in-depth knowledge of things that he'll explain to us in terms that we'll understand, like GSM and CDMA and low power and Wi-Fi and some other things. Prior to becoming CTO uh, for wireless technologies, he, was, uh, he worked with several of the company clients of Nortel working on a 3G rollout for things that, you know, not too many years ago were thought to be uh, magic. But many of you may have them on your belt, uh, your Blackberry or your phone that actually can take pictures. Just stay out of my locker room, okay? It's too scary. Uh, he may be the only person in this room that's an electrical engineer, but he's one of those great electrical engineers who not only is, understands engineering, but he went to business school, so he gets it. And for best of all for us, uh, he's one of those that speaks Eng engineering in English. And he's going to help us understand sort of what's, what's, what's coming for us in the next 10 or 15 years. You can either come here to the podium, and I'll sit there, or whichever. Which um, works. I guess I kind of cut off about a third of the room. I probably should stand up at right. the podium. Oh, that's right. So, well, oh, thanks, for that, uh, <laughs> thanks for that great introduction. So, really, mobile wireless broadband, we believe, is going to be the future of the wireless industry over the many over many years to come. If you think of the wireless industry over the last 15 years, it's really all been based off of one very simple but powerful application, and that's mobile voice. And uh, you know, don't get me wrong here, there's still a lot of growth in mobile voice. You know, every year, every month, the minutes of use on the networks keeps on increasing uh, for the existing subscribers. And then if you look in the emerging markets, um, especially in the emerging markets, places like Russia and India, in China, huge amounts of subscribers are just getting their first taste of wireless and starting to use the networks. But there's going to be a new source of growth um, in the industry, and that is mobile wireless broadband. And it's taken a while, and it's been a bit of a rough start. Uh, like a lot of new technologies, there's a lot of experimentation at the beginning and trying to get the right mix um, to make it easy for the user. Uh, but wireless data and wireless broadband are really starting to hit their stride. And it, it's different uh, depending where you live and uh, and, and where you are in terms of the applications that we're starting to see. So in Europe, um, short messaging, very simple wireless data has really taken off. Um, GSM is a technology that's used predominantly in Europe and in Asia. It's got about a billion subscribers, but those billion subscribers exchange 45 billion short messages every month. And it's there, you know, it's like IN. So it's a huge, um, huge value. Uh, proposition for them. In the U.S., what we're seeing is wireless email is really taking off, thanks to you know, companies like RIM and, Black, you know, and their BlackBerry device, and we've got a couple here. <laughs> um, it's really made wireless email easy. And uh, we're also seeing camera phones really hitting stride. Um, in Asia, almost anything goes. Um, lots of new applications, but very uh, different for the different environments in terms of uh, you know, people downloading cartoons, uh, video, um, gaming applications. So if you want to understand what the wireless broad, broadband market should look like in five, ten years, and, and we try to think about this ourselves, you know, what types of systems would we want to have? What types of things would they, they, we want them to do? And you know, one of the things I think about is, is looking at what a teenager uses a, a wired connection, a wire broadband connection for right now. I've got a ten-year-old daughter, my oldest daughter, and uh, from personal experience watching her surf on my cable modem connection, it's, it's amazing. I mean, a rapid succession of sites, AmericanGirl.com, Barbie.com, you know, Disney.com, downloading trailers or for movies, downloading music, uh, doing IMs, um, very intense and very, uh, very high bandwidth demanding user. So, and the reason I, I look at that is that's more on the entertainment side, but if you can meet the, the needs of that type of user, um, in terms of the capacity 
um, requirements. Um, then when you look at the rest of, the rest of us, uh, the business users and the government users, I think the only thing you really have to consider then is some of the security aspects because definitely a lot of the, the bandwidth would be incorporated by meeting those types of needs. And so th then you start to look at different types of applications in terms of video conferencing, FBI agents accessing databases around uh, the country, you know, access to aircraft maintenance information, wherever you are, huge manuals get reduced to, uh, to just basically accessing um, over the web or Wi-Fi whenever you want. So we're at the very beginning of this whole mobile wireless broadband um, application, but we start to notice a few things already that are a little different than uh, the wired um, internet world. And the one thing we've noticed is that in a mobile environment, people tend to want to receive and transmit data a lot more. They actually want to communicate with people a lot more. Uh, when you're using a wired connection, um, there's a lot more downloading of files, a lot more downloading of web pages. It tends to be a lot more of the network communicating to you. Uh, but there's something about being mobile, uh, whether you're doing a, a video conference on the move, whether you're um, doing short messages, uh, whether you're doing camera phones, that people want to communicate and it seems to be that they want to share their experiences as they move around with others. So we're seeing a lot more collaboration. It actually changes the designs of the systems in terms of you know, how much information. Now it's a lot more balanced in terms of the information that's being received and transmitted. So the applications and the devices really will drive a lot of the uses going forward. And, and that's pretty clear. But what I wanted to kind of give you a bit of insight is some of what we see as some of the enabling technologies um, that will, will allow a lot of this to happen. And so I think the easiest way to start off of, at, it, at looking at it is really to, to look at the network and break it into two segments. And I kind of call those the, the local area and the wide area because they're quite different in terms of uh, the way the systems uh, you know, are, are working today and I, I think we'll keep on working that way. So let's start with the local area. So the dominant technology there is, it's no surprise, is Wi-Fi. And for in your home, in a building, um, in a hot spot like a Starbucks cafe, in a limited area in a, in a city, uh, really Wi-Fi offers the best you know, cost structure and economics for, for coverage and, and high, high speed data in those particular areas. But Wi-Fi is not standing still. There's a lot of innovations that are coming out to, to make Wi-Fi better. Uh, one of the first is called meshing. And right now, if you think of every uh, Wi-Fi access spot, they're connected through a wire back to the rest of the network. Now, that's a, that's a real economic challenge, especially when you're doing public hotspots. And uh, meshing is a way for each of, the, each of the access points to communicate with another access point um, over, over the air. So effectively, you aggregate all the traffic over the air uh, back to single um, network connection points. So you don't have nearly the number of wires and number of uh, wired connections to each of those Wi-Fi wi access points. And that's important because uh, it makes the economics better, um, it makes the installation a lot easier, the systems tend to be self-discovering, it makes the, um, the whole system a lot more simple, simple to install and administer. Another thing on the Wi-Fi front is voice over IP. It, it's kind of a natural to add voice over IP to Wi-Fi, in many cases the infrastructure is there. And although the system was first developed just for data alone, um, we really envision that uh, you know, it's a cost-effective approach in, at the home and in the buildings to, to be adding voice, especially voice over IP. And then there's standards work. There's uh, new generations of Wi-Fi coming out, 802.11n, which will further increase the, uh, the throughputs. So the economies for Wi-Fi, even with those changes, we believe kind of breaks down when you, when you have a coverage area of more than a couple city blocks or in a very very dense coverage area, and you want to have very high-speed mobile, mobile users. And the next coverage area that we think people are really looking for is really you know, what we call the wide area um, wireless network. And what that is is, is effectively what uh, you know, the wireless operators like the Verizons and Sprints and Singulars and, and people like that provide today. Really being able to have high-speed wireless broadband access wherever you go, whether that's at the beach, uh, whether it's uh, you know, in an Amtrak train, in the back of a car. So it's all those places that, uh, that Wi-Fi can't get to um, economically. So the existing networks, um, you know, in terms of the, the wide area, um, they're themselves being upgraded. And we've had kind of a continual evolution of technology. You hear about different generations that are being talked about. And we're going through 
uh, various upgrades, and over the next few years, you know, the data, the data capabilities of those systems will probably be increasing, you know, four to five fold, maybe a bit beyond that in certain technologies. But, uh, you know, we have to kind of ask ourselves, you know, is that really enough to meet a lot of the demand that's going to be coming up in a few years, just uh, looking at the past and the explosive growth of wireless. And some of the technologies that we feel are important in the wide area are kind of new modulation schemes. So every year, well, every generation, we, we look at trying to get more effectively bits of data out of the same spectrum. And all sorts of interesting techniques about using uh, multiple antennas in your devices. So it's, a, it's an area called OFDM MIMO, and I've been told to avoid using too many acronyms, but uh, something that's going to be coming in the future uh, really allows for higher speed data applications and, uh, um, you know, th that we feel that are quite possible with the systems today and, and effectively ends up lowering the cost structure as well. Compression, you know, compression is incredibly important. On the wireline networks, we don't, uh, we tend to have a lot of bandwidth, so we don't always, um, you know, treat the, treat the data as efficiently as we could. You know, kind of one of the extremes in terms of applications is the gaming applications. When, when you've got a, when you've got a high resolution video, um, facial features, high speed movement, um, it actually tends to even use more bandwidth demands than, than, than video. If you think of a lot of TV itself, um, TV, a, a lot of the characters are stationary um, for long periods of time, and there really isn't the same type of dynamic behavior. So kind of existing gaming applications drive about 150 kilobits per second. You know, with compression, um, you can get that down to in the range of 30 kilobits per second, but then you know, the larger and larger screens might drive that even higher up. But to give you a perspective, voice only takes about 8 to 10 kilobits per second. So we're looking at many of these applications looking at a five-fold or a ten-fold um, increase in the amount of bandwidth that they're, that's going to be required. Um, new spectrum is always important to keep that ahead of what the what the users, uh, what the um, uh, the operators require, and voice over IP again. You know, voice over IP, uh, we believe will be driven in the wide area network, really because of the richness of applications that you can get with multimedia. So I've kind of gone through some of the technology enablers for the local area and and then the wide area. So we've got these two domains, and in many ways we've made the user's life a little more complicated. Um, I don't know if you've done a count of your voicemails, but uh, in my family I think I've got about five. We've got a phone for my wife and I, and we've got a phone that gets shared with the kids. I've got a work vo voicemail, a home voicemail, multiple email accounts. So even though we've kind of got the optimal technologies in the different places, we need to kind of bring it all together and make life a lot easier for the user and simplify our, our communications. So really there's two points that, uh, that we think are coming up there. Uh, one is what we call the converged core of the network. Really there's, um, you know, and, and the real thrust here is to, is to have separate networks in terms of the user's access to the network and how they get on the network, but the actual core of the network that handles the data, that provides security, that provides authentication, um, that uh, you know, provides the transport can be common. And that's a, that's a key thrust. It can be common between the different wireless technologies and in wireline. And what that does is it provides um, also, in many cases, uh, lots of applications that you know can become between a user, whether they're mobile or, or whether they're fixed, and, and allows, a, a lot, allows a lot easier use and, in many cases, the same type of look and feel. Of course, dual mode, ter dual mode terminals are important, and we're starting to see a lot of those. In, cell in wireless already, we have a lot of dual mode terminals as they roam between different networks. But uh, we're starting to see, on the horizon, GSM and Wi-Fi terminals. Um, and that's certainly going to, we, we see evolving to voice over IP as well. Um, and the mechanisms to hand off between those networks are, are something that uh, the industry is working out. So to kind of wrap up, you know, the wireless broadband market, the mobile wireless broadband market has really started. And it is the future of the wireless industry. And there's a lot of enabling technologies that are on the path to, um, to allow users to, to have that same type of experience they have on the web and more. Because to, uh, we find that nature of that activity a lot more interactive. So where's it going? Well, this is, it's really hard to predict. In 10 to 15 years from now, um, I kind of, I think we're going to be in the same situation as, as we are today. You know, 10 to 15 years ago, no, none of us really probably understood the potential of, of mobile wireless voice. The projections have all been exceeded significantly. So uh, I think the mobile 
But the wireless industry and the mobile wireless broadband applications and the value they'll provide will just continue to surprise us. So thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of questions for you already, but I'm not going to ask them right off. But I want you guys to ask the questions. So if, if you haven't thought of a couple of questions, uh, I'll, I'll prod you with uh, some more like, when, when is this, when am, when am I going to be able to get rid of my real computer and, and, and have it all in my palm and such? Um, but before we go for the questions, uh, the, our, our next speaker is uh, Jim Snyder. And again, he, he is a senior research fellow at the New American Foundation, one of several at the foundation who uh, really get this stuff and are writing some very useful things. And I recommend that you go to the website uh, and take a look at it. Uh, he has, uh, he, he understands you uh, because he spent a year on the Hill himself in the Senate as an American Political Science Association Congressional Fellow uh, for Communications and Public Policy. So he understands how little you might know about all of this or how much you, how much you're, uh, you are sponges and want to learn about this stuff quickly. Uh, he, uh, he's been at school in a couple of places that matter, such as Harvard and Northwestern University. Uh, he's got several uh, uh, books on this topic. One of my favorites, and he's going to use uh, some slides from it, is uh, uh, the, the, in the New America Foundation does a very good job of this, using language that the rest of us can understand. For example, he must have been a good college teacher at some point or other, right? Uh, it's a cartoon guide to spectrum policy. Uh, and he asked me essentially to ask him on his first, on the basic question about what, what about licensed versus unlicensed spectrum? And why does it matter? What, why do we care? And what's it going to enable for us? You're going to get from me a pretty futuristic uh, view of uh, unlicensed spectrum. And I want to lay out my premises uh, up front uh, central assumption is the technological problem is solved. And what I mean by that are three things. First of all, um, computer devices, uh, negligible in cost, chips are maybe a couple of pennies. Um, zero space, the size of uh, dust particles, uh, great uh, intelligence, uh, processing power. It doesn't have to be too much for most of these devices, but uh, substantial. Uh, and then the same thing on the on the wireless side. Uh, essentially, uh, zero cost uh, unlicensed devices or wireless devices, uh, tiny size uh, and um, great bandwidth. And so instead of a FM radio type of bandwidth, it's just 20 megahertz goes up gigahertz up and down. And then the third thing is those two types of technologies merge. So we leave the era of dumb radios, which is what we have now. Very few of us have ever experienced anything close to a smart radio. The closest thing would be your cell phone, which knows that it's in one market versus another. It can adjust and has some sensitivity uh, to its environment. But this is a, a radical change in thinking about radio as computers and wireless devices uh, merge. Uh, this may sound radical, but this type of uh, inspiration is what Intel and Texas, interests, uh, Texas Instruments and the MIT Media Lab this is the premise on which they're developing uh, their vision of the future. They want to sell not one computer to every individual, but literally thousands, believe it or not, of individuals to every home. They want to be like dust particles, basically. And, and then when you get that idea in your, your, your mind, all sorts of uh, new uh, imaginative uh, possibilities open up. So having said that, let's start with an image we're going to go over. I'm just focusing on low power, unlicensed devices and how it's going to impact our lives in quite profound ways. We're going to start with an image within the home, how it's going to change your, your, your life at, at home. So unfortunately, uh, the text didn't show up here, and it's uh, uh, some of it. Uh, one of the things you may uh, not know is that the average American now has far more unlicensed devices in their home. Uh, or that they own than licensed devices. So th some of the common licensed devices would be TVs, uh, radios, and mobile telephones. But uh, uh, Americans often have now 30 or 40 unlicensed devices. It's so much built into our lives we barely know. So uh, cordless phones, uh, 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 toys, uh, wireless toys, um, 
your garage door opener, your keyless car entry, uh, your remote controls, Wi-Fi has certainly gotten um, uh, a lot of um, attention, um, alar alarm systems, monitoring systems, a baby monitor, they're proliferating um, um, all over the place. Now, what are some of the, the new types of devices coming uh, along? We've traditionally had UPC codes. Everything you buy in a store is it's got a print code. The retail industry is moving away from paper codes to RFID, radio frequency ID codes. So you will have, just in terms of radio frequency ID codes, probably every food item you'll have in the future will have a, uh, I think they're down about 20 cents now for a chip. I hope to get it down you know, within five years to less than a penny, a chip, an RFID. So what type of thing does that open up here? Unfortunately, the text doesn't uh, show up here. So here's your refrigerator here. Uh, you have a computer, you decide you want to make a particular dish at night, it goes through automatically your pantry and your, the contents of your refrigerator tells you what ingredients you need. It can monitor your diet. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, uh, it's got all sorts of uh, uh, flexibility uh, and then you can have in all of your devices, instead of having paper warranties and manuals which you always lose and whatnot, all your products will have built-in RFID warranties, manuals, and whatnot. You'll just, when you need it, you'll go to it. And, and uh, all, all your appliances. And then there'll be sensors. Uh, here's a, um, uh, uh, your air filter uh, needs replacing. You've got a plant. My daughter is always forgetting. We've got lots of plants in the house to water the plants and they die. So you have a little sensor that senses when uh, it's dry, dry, it needs to be watered, and sends out uh, an alert. So uh, every mechanical device has problems, and you could have uh, wireless device alert, alerting you that you have a maintenance problem uh, uh, or something. Um, so let's see here. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go through some of the, uh, uh, the standard scenarios. Here, this is our link to the next slide, which is uh, your Wi-Fi can link Instead of digging up your, your roses in your front yard to lay the next generation network, it can link to the utility box in front of your house. Uh, it happens to be that last link, the economics of the last mile, is about 50% of the cost of the total network. There's no economies of scale. When you're digging a trench down the street, you can, have, you can serve 10,000 households at the same time. When you dig up your front lawn, you're serving one. There are no economies of scale. It's a great application for a low power unlicensed. So uh, with that, we'll, we'll move on to um, uh, oh, just uh, w one other thing that's coming. It's not really 10 years out. is wireless USB, which is today you've got lots of wires with your computer, your stereo sets, all this. All those wires are going to be cut. Uh, Intel has, uh, and TI are coming out with their uh, wireless USB, which is uh, 488 megabits a, a second. So no more wires for anything. Connecting your printer, your joystick, uh, uh, your devices in your home, that, that area is going to come to an end soon. Okay, so now outside the home, some uh, types of uh, applications. The Homeland Security, uh, they want to be able to seal every device coming into the United States uh, with RFID on every device. They want to be able to do instantaneous inventories uh, and be able to check for any tampering so they can really control uh, 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 what's coming in and out of the country uh, it gives them a, a whole new new level uh, of, uh, uh, of security. This is the Walmart vision. We have 11 million uh, or so uh, retail workers in the United States. I don't know how many work out at the checkout counter or doing inventory, but I would say uh, their jobs uh, are in danger. We're going to move into a, a new world. Uh, most of the early RFID are for the inventory management coming off the truck, no more paper forms and whatnot, all of the inventory management in the distribution sector will be RFID. That, I think, will happen for the major chains within five years. At the item level, uh, it's going to take a, 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 li a little bit longer. Uh, classrooms, we already have quite a bit of wireless. We have these uh, very high-speed connections now going to millions of school buildings, these uh, INETs. Uh, getting them into the classroom is still a problem. A lot of places are still using wires, which is really insane. They should be wireless networks uh, in the school, which not only are less expensive, 
but provide much greater flexibility for students and how they use their um, uh, and how they communicate. This is a uh, Sears Tower in Chicago, a, a well-known building. They've got uh, a, a Wi-Fi mesh network now in all 110 stories. Uh, uh, when you run an office building, and every few years the standards change, it's, it's very expensive going from CAT 5 to CAT 5E to CAT 6 and so on. Uh, this is the way to do it in the future. Uh, these uh, low power, very high speed uh, uh, unlicensed networks. Uh, a, uh, public safety, uh, all, all the talk here in D.C. is about a dedicated uh, spectrum for public safety, but actually go look in the heartland. They're making extensive use in small communities now throughout the United States of unlicensed spectrum. We're going to get that, come to that in, in, in a minute more, but some of the scenarios, uh, are they, the, the idea of uh, breadcrumb devices, you go into a burning building or whatever it is and you just drop these wireless uh, uh, devices, you create this instantaneous mesh network so you immediately know where you are and you set up a spontaneous network. The, uh, one of the really interesting examples is DARPA has this XG program which is the military can instantaneously set up a, a telecommunications network anywhere in the field. Uh, every uh, soldier uh, with his helmet becomes a no, like a cell tower in the network, and they, uh, because they, most spectrum is unused any time in the world, they can set up an instantaneous, very high speed uh, network uh, on the fly. That's an extension of the principle here um, for public safety. So uh, the most, ex uh, oh, here's, here's uh, uh, trains. Uh, the, uh, the Paris Metro has got Wi-Fi in the stations. They're planning on putting them uh, in the trains. Uh, Boeing has a, sub, uh, a, a division called Connection, and they're going to allow you to take your laptop instead of having to plug it in. You'll have a wireless uh, uh, access uh, in airplanes, a compelling um, uh, application. So, but the big uh, enchilada, what people are most excited with, are these uh, large scale met mesh network, where if you look at the heartland, they're being deployed all over the United States. The current issue of government technology, which is quite important for local government, is a feature on how local mesh networks are making a difference. Uh, the, most of the article is on uh, Garland, Texas, a community of 200,000 out uh, 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 outside of uh, Dallas, where they're connecting very low, uh, uh, very inexpensive wire, uh, 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 unlicensed devices on the lampposts, the power poles, the ATM machines, um, uh, 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 the traffic signals all over. And it's, uh, it's a tiny fraction of setting up a, a, a cost of setting up a 3G network. Now, they've mostly done it for government use. So for law enforcement, for the meter readers, fire and rescue, electronic emergency, works with the cars, it's high speed. They've covered the whole downtown area and some of the um, surrounding areas. Uh, uh, a bunch of companies are working on this. Tropos, they're the ones that did the, uh, the open park thing here. So you're walking down the mall. It's a mesh network. Uh, the thing about mesh is it's very I efficient because the cells are so small, you get uh, 20, 100 times uh, more capacity than a 3G network. Uh, and, it's, and it's dynamic. And it's also more secure because we now have, for the most part, hierarchical networks. Like the internet was designed, so if one node goes down, it's a mesh, you can circumvent it around it. Same thing with these mesh networks. They're much more secure. If one nose goes down, they're intelligent routers. They just immediately uh, go, go around it. So this is the, uh, the link between um, uh, this picture and the other one. So you got them on the, the telephone poles or whatever it is and connecting to the home. So uh, the, the, the vision now of the future is uh, we don't need t 10 times more bandwidth is not enough. We need 1,000 times more bandwidth. We need a gigahertz of unlicensed every home. It's we're moving to a gigabit internet. Uh, that's the goal. That's what we're going to need with all these devices monitoring everything and high resolution and whatnot. And uh, this is insane given our current policies. Nobody could dream of it. We're struggling with 3G to get 500K or a megabit. To talk about a gigabit to the home is unheard of. But that's the vision we need. The only way to get there is through tiny cells. And if you've got tiny cells, Unlicensed is the way to go. Just quickly, though, tell us why. Why is what's so wrong with license? Why does license get in the way? Well, there's a question of what you mean by license. But why should I have to pay you when I want to use my garage door opener? 
what right do you, you have? Or I want to use my remote control. Or why, why should I pay? What's the efficiency gain in doing that? It's a crazy. And why when I'm using public rights away? Should I pay a third party? We've got this you know, intelligent transportation network and all, all these things. I mean, I don't see the gain. Uh, it's low power. It's, why should Sears Tower have to pay a third party when it wants to have its own? I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't see the advantage. So. That's a perfect, actually, uh, transition point to Josh Balin, because whenever you have technologies, they're destructive of the technologies before them, among other things. Uh, what we really care about uh, on the Hill, of course, is what about jobs in our district as well as uh, what about new technologies that we can make, we can help our constituents uh, take advantage of. Uh, Josh is here to do the reality test of uh, sort of both Wall Street and sort of the economics of all of this coming forward. Um, Josh is associate al analyst at uh, Lake Mason Equity Research. Uh, he joined them in, in 2003 after working for Bloomberg here in, here in uh, Washington, D.C. So he gets the economics of what we do as well as the economics of this industry. He's been covering broadband equipment industry, currently working on expanded coverage, including uh, mobile ter terminals, infrastructure, and operating system. He follows some wireless uh, equipment companies that we care about, or uh, if, especially if they have plants in our district, uh, Nokia, Ericsson, Motorola, Lucent, uh, Nor Nortel. Uh, he, when he was a reporter, he followed many of these same uh, issues, so he's used to speaking in English. Um, he uh, has a degree from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and at the end, he promised me he's even going to tell us what stocks we should buy or sell. Uh, so, uh, Josh, have at it. Whichever. Which you, uh, I'll sit here. That's can, fine. Can they see you? Good. Uh, okay. Well, I don't. Uh, I don't really want to be giving you all stock advice, not at this time. Oh, come on. I got my, uh, my BlackBerry here. It's connected to my stock broker. <laughs> Good luck. Um, so uh, I want to start off and, and sort of give my own disclosure here uh, as I've become sort of so accustomed to doing in the, in the brave new world of financial regulations. Um, the first thing I want all of you to understand is, is kind of uh, I could be absolutely wrong with everything I'm about to tell you. <laughs> Nobody on the Hill ever has that problem. <laughs> when, when you start talking, as, as John said, about disruptive technologies, it gets very complicated. Um, it, because those certain things come clear to certain businesses, business models change, uh, policies are made, and people, believe it or not, um, as these graphics show, they, they may not even want all this kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know if you want it. I don't necessarily want it. Um, that being said, uh, you know, I, I'll sort of try to start. Now, I will say, speaking as the third uh, panelist, uh, a lot's already been covered, so I'm going to kind of rush through and get to your, so, so we can get to your questions to, to better, uh, better serve what you all want. So uh, to think that we're here, to think that what we're here for is to discuss the fact in 10 years we'll be able to log on to the Internet uh, from a la uh, you know, on your laptop from Starbucks or McDonald's or Jiffy Lube for that matter. It's really missing the point. Um, you'll be able to do that, but, but in many cases, I mean, that's really possible today, whether you're using Wi-Fi or wide area networks. What, what that is is really just an extension of, of a current phenomenon. Uh, I mean, in all likelihood, it's faster, it's cheaper, but for all intents and purposes, the service is the exact same thing. The function is the same. So it's really like the first generation of mobile phones, like you were talking about with voice. They apparently did amazing things, but all they really did was allow voice calls on the go. So what I really want to address is how connectivity on the Internet enables a whole new set of data applications and really creates a whole new value chain in wireless. So what the Internet actually becomes, in my view, is sort of what it was intended to be, which is the information superhighway and is really the enabler in, in wireless technology. So the wireless Internet basically becomes this new platform for development and the transfer of information. Um, it, it becomes a new platform for device integration. Um, and, and when I say devices, I don't just mean, you know, your iPods, your Blackberries, your mobiles, all of which weigh me down every day. But I'm talking about cars, computers, televisions, washing machines, microwaves, lights, cameras, whatever you can really imagine, even books through the RFID tags. 
So, you know, clearly there are a lot of companies that I follow that are making headway in all these areas. Nortel, Motorola, Nokia, Ericsson, they're all doing things here. So, first I want to talk about some of the new applications, and then I'll kind of get in a little bit to some of the policy issues that come up. Uh, so, take a look at what IBM announced this week. If you missed it, IBM basically said they're going to develop a whole new set of business applications designed to work entirely through the Internet. Your word processing program no, no longer needs to be run on a Microsoft system or an Apple or a Linux or Sun. No matter where you are, the environment is, uh, you know, it's through the Internet, so you can access it anywhere. Some other examples could be in your car where maybe an LCD panel in the front or back seat could play music or video from your home server or from a centralized server where you purchase content, either through Apple or through Motorola or, you know, through wireless carriers like Verizon Wireless. It, What's going to be neat, though, is when these new wireless networks actually enable us to buy content. And of course, this is all happening over the Internet. So in some ways, the way we know the Internet now in 15 years, it, it more or less disappears. What the Internet is valuable for in 15 years is the functionality it provides and the common platform it provides. Um, other examples, maybe, maybe paying tolls, finding parking spaces, video conferencing, um, looking at a presentation, uh, finding information about books or music, musicians, just by touching a device. I mean, imagine walking into a bookstore, touching your mobile phone to a book, and all of a sudden having all the information, being able to even purchase the book just by doing that. Um, so really, th this new realm of application development is, is what creates this new value chain in, in, the wireless, uh, in the wireless space. Now, the policy issues that arise are, uh, are somewhat complicated. Of course, you're getting into digital rights management, some privacy concerns, as you can see from all those different interactions. You don't want everybody looking at you all the time. And uh, obviously, there are spectrum issues when you get into license, unlicensed. There are security issues, interstate commerce issues. Um, I, you know, I'd say that you all probably have a much tougher, tougher job than any of us do. Um, but the bottom line is, from a policy perspective, I, I'm sort of of the, of the belief that giving as much freedom to the information and to the content as possible while also making the most available spectrum is, is really the best thing to do, the best policy to pursue. So, you know, the bigger the canvas for, for entrepreneurs to develop new applications and new devices, uh, really the better I think we all are. So the key to all this, uh, as Jim said, really are these new devices and these new networks that are going to start emerging. Um, now, I want to actually get back to a point uh, that John made earlier when he broke the network into the local area and the wide area. We've actually done some looking here, uh, some, some uh, research here, and we've broken it one step further into the personal area. So, you know, your Wi-Fi and your mesh is the local, your wide area, your cellular, and your personal are these RFID tags, your Bluetooth. And what a lot of companies like the Motorola's of the world and the Nokia's are doing is they're actually trying to combine all three of these networks onto one device and have smart devices and smart networks that are um, aware, really, of what network you're on and what the best networks are to access um, these applications. Um, as far as you know, Nortel is doing it, Lucent's doing it, like I said, Ericsson, Motorola, all these big wireless infrastructure providers. Um, what they're also doing on the device side uh, is interesting as well. Now, from a device side, the key, as both, of, as both the other panelists have pointed out, is simplicity, uh, ease of use, and, and really intuitiveness. You know, you can only look at the growth of the MP3 market and pretty much this device did it all. Before the iPod, there really wasn't much. So what a lot of these companies are doing, Nokia, they're out there making mobile gaming devices. Motorola is out there making mobile music devices. Samsung is out making mobile video devices. And you know, as, as consumers begin to use this stuff more and more, there become more and more opportunities, again, to build that wireless value chain. So. Again, I don't want to repeat a lot of the stuff that's been said, but you know, what, what I kind of want to leave you with is, is we really are at the beginning stages, and, and the most you can do from a policy perspective is to free up as, most, uh, you know, as much spectrum as you can, uh, improve the efficiency of the spectrum that's being used, and really uh, you know, allow for the exchange of media and let it develop in a competitive market. You know, of course, a, as you get into some of these spectrum issues, you start stepping on toes of people like Verizon and Nextel and you know, a number of other carriers out there. But um, unless we're in a competitive environment, you're going to see a lot of the innovation that 
we're talking about up here really stimmied. So. Great. All right, more questions up here. I got a couple, but I need some more. I'm going to start out with one sort of the pickup uh, with uh, uh, one of the, the uh, sort of the, the give and take already on the panel and see if I can draw some more out. Um, I'll start uh, with John on to give us a, a sort of the technical perspective. Uh, one of the things we need is sort of more speed in this uh, wireless technology. How much more speed do we need or how do we get there and how fast is too fast? And then the sort of question about that, what does that have to do with additional spectrum and the kinds of questions uh, that others have raised here? But sort of technically, you know, what, what, what do we need to get this done? So, <clears throat> I mean, that, that's a bit of a tough question because, uh, you know, a lot of it depends on the applications and a lot of it depends on the devices as I, as I was talking about. Um, you know, we, we've tried to, to look at what some of the applications are that really are going to stress the, stress the system and then kind of back off from there to understand uh, what everyone else would need. So, and that's why I kind of came to, to my application about gaming. But, it, you know, it, it, there, there's, a, there's a lot of dependency on the device. So, so in many ways, the devices themselves drive a lot of it. If you think of actually trying to take, you know, HDTV to the home, um, you know, over a wireless device, then you're looking at something that's 10 to 20 megabits. So you can very quickly get very, very high bandwidths. Um, but it's really trying to, to map what the device is capable of, what the applications are, and, and then look at the users themselves, because not all users want it at the same time. You know, there's, a, there's very much a traffic model that happens. So, so it's, it's the type of thing we're starting to to get some better handles on as we go, but uh, but I think the, always the question will be, you know, the device itself and the applications. You know, how can we really envision what the what those will be in, in, at their highest speeds? And and history's kind of shown that we're not not always good at predicting that. So so that's uh, the fastest speed a car was supposed to be able to go in their <laughs> wireless carriage is 60 miles an hour. I would just hour. like to make a comment. I don't think HDTV is an adequate standard. I think magazine quality or the resolution of the human eye. If you compare a high-quality magazine page to HGTV, you immediately see that HGTV is just a blurry image. And so the goal should be the resolution of the human eye, fidelity to what we perceive. And that's a, that's a standard 100 times or higher than the HGTV standard. Uh, so that's, that should be the long-term goal. Whether it's realistic in the short term is another question, but we should know what our goal is. All right, let's take it then to then sort of the next step in the policy arena part of it. If the, the USA Today was right, the, the FCC this morning, or maybe this afternoon, is going to make more spectrum available for wireless. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to get that spectrum between the existing license spectrum for TV. Uh, I don't know if this is true or not, but the question that I have for you, uh, the, especially the two policy sides on this, are both of maybe a technical and a policy side, uh, is this a lot of the spectrum we need for these kinds of speeds and these kinds of applications? Uh, and then the other question I'm sure that broadcasters are going to raise, isn't this going to interfere with the uh, existing uses of that spectrum by uh, the uh, broadcasters who are, who are now using it? Uh, who wants to start? There's lots of different ways to uh, use spectrum from the broadcast bin. One way is on a dedicated basis. So broadcasters have to give back 52 to 69. And so uh, New America is advocating that we take the 24 megahertz for public safety, but we divide the second, the, the, the remainder in half, half auctioned off for license purpose, the other half for a public park for unlicensed. But there are other ways to, to fit in unlicensed. One way is an underlay. Underlay is different than primary. In, uh, I'm speaking to you loudly now, but you could talk to your neighbor and whisper in their ear. That's an underlay. You can do that. You can communicate effectively, and it doesn't bother anybody else in the room. People should be able to whisper uh, in, in a, in, 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 among loud broadcasters. So there should be an underlay throughout the entire broadcast band. If I want to use my remote control in my home and not pick up the, the TV signal, I should have that privilege. And then also there's opportunistic use 
which is what the military is developing, their unlicensed model. And that is, they listen, somebody isn't using a band, even if it's assigned to them, they use it. Because the military knows less than 1% of the spectrum, even in dense urban areas, is used at any one time. And that's how they're building their networks. And why should, if we can do it overseas, why can't we do it domestically? If, if spectrum is being unused, it, it should be available. So that's a third, that's opportunistic uh, unlicensed sharing. Let me, uh, I, the broadcasters aren't represented on this panel. I don't represent broadcasters. I'm not necessarily uh, taking this as a, my own personal position, but I'll, I'll talk to you about what they used to talk to me about when I was at the FCC, the AMization of the, of the TV band. And what they, what they meant by that is essentially if you guys keep, you know, allowing all these other uses and, and putting more and more stations on and such, all we'll have is a medium like the existing AM radio. My guess is virtually none of you in this audience listen to AM radio, or if so, not very much. And to the extent that you do listen to it, you probably don't listen to it at all at night. And that's because there's just way too much interference there. What has happened, some have suggested, by this more aggressive uh, kind of uh, spectrum use that you're suggesting, uh, is eliminate uh, the value of any uses at all. You want to respond to that? Is that just rhetoric from the broadcast industry? I have to say, I, I'm sorry. I was distracted thinking about that. Well, but think of the, 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 the basic question is what about interference when you do? I, okay, uh, it, they can talk I, I, over, under their breath over there, but you know, they might distract all the people around them. The key thing about interference, which people don't recognize, and this is the whole shift that the FCC is shifting towards in how they're regulating spectrum, is interference happens at the receiver, it's not there at the transmitter. So if you have more intelligent receivers, you can discriminate. So. Uh, this is a little bit complicated, but uh, let's say we have a broadcast tower up here and a receiver here. If it's a directional receiver, like a satellite dish, you can now have another communication that's coming from here and there, and it doesn't necessarily interfere. The best example would be North Point. We have DBS, uh, 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 DBS allocation where you have a signal coming from up high down to a dish. North Point discovered they could send a signal horizontally uh, and it, it, it would not interfere with this, but that requires intelligent receivers. So interference is largely a function of the quality of the receiving equipment, and on almost any interference problem can be solved with uh, improved receiver equipment. Uh, would, would you want to say something about the difference between digital and analog, and how as an engineering function uh, that may help resolve some of these questions? So, um, yeah, I mean, digital and analog, uh, you know, there's, there's not a lot of analog uh, wireless mobiles around anymore. I mean, it's kind of a, kind of a, you know, something that has still quite a bit of rural use, but not uh, a lot of us have really gone to digital, although we don't really sometimes even know it. But uh, we do have to be careful with interference. Um, you, know, uh, you know, it's uh, it's one of those areas that, uh, um, you know, as more and more systems get together, even though it's low power, you still, you know, can bang up against each other. And uh, so your expectations start off great at the beginning, and then over time, you know, you, you, you run into issues that, uh, you know, as you get more and more folks that you can, you can run into problems. There's a lot of advances in technology. There's a lot of things that, uh, in terms of very smart radios and all the rest, um, a lot of advanced things that, uh, uh, that people are working on and, and we uh, uh, were involved with. With, but uh, you know, we've already got a very complex system. You're adding an additional level of complexity, and uh, you know, a lot is possible. But uh, it's it's just an area that a lot of care has to be taken. Otherwise, that you know, to avoid that we we all don't get less service in the end, uh, just when when we want more, when it's wildly popular. But digital solves a lot of those old analog problems. Uh, a question from you guys, uh, which is a privacy question, but it also turns out to be a security question, and I'll ask uh, any of the panelists to deal with it, and it's an engineering question as well as a policy question. Uh, are there ways to prevent the problems of unlicensed bandwidth posed to privacy, for example, neighbors being able to eavesdrop on each other with their cordless phones? You want to do the engineering side of that one first? 
Yeah, uh, you know, there's a lot of security features built into the systems today. Some people don't always turn them on. Um, some of the technologies are older technologies, and so you've got to coexist, and that's kind of where the, the interference, you have to really take that into account as well. Um, uh, you know, in terms of privacy, you know, encryption from the end user to, to, to the systems, uh, you know, we have a whole series of technologies over the, the internet itself and over wireless, you know, whether you go you know, keys, public key systems, IPsec, SSL, and there's a whole bunch of different uh, varieties of security and complexity that each one of those those brings. Um, sometimes there's a trade-off between the level of security you want and the amount of bandwidth you take. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, with the older systems and your, your analog example, um, you run into those types of things. Digital still, you, you can have that type of interference, and people can, but you've got to, you know, you've got to use the existing technologies and, you know, like a Wi-Fi systems, people have to turn on the security features. And some of, sometimes it's a bit of education that's involved as well. Well, let's, let's do it and, and, and go sort of one step and more complicated than that. What, what's to stop uh, the, the Wi-Fi whiz in my office or my, my opponent's office from taking his Wi-Fi enabled system and coming over to my office or outside my office or next door my office and listening in to virtually all that we're doing inside of our office, including our own strategic discussions and others. And all three of you, anyone? Well, th th this is a widely recognized problem. One way to solve that is you have a jammer. So you, if you jam the frequency, you can be assured that that can't happen. And I, I imagine a lot of businesses will start putting jammers all over the place when they have something important uh, going on. on. On the privacy thing, one of the compelling, I, I don't know how many of you have seen the X10 wireless camera thing. Apparently, there's several million American households now that have these wireless cameras. And it's a real point of sensitivity. My daughters go out to babysit. You know, you never know if they're in the bathroom or whatever it might be. And one of the fellows at New America a, is the journalist, got a lot of equipment. She had a, uh, a housekeeper that would come in, and the housekeeper quit because she knows that a lot of people have these wireless things. And she thought, because there was all this TV equipment, that she was being monitored there, and she didn't trust her. So it's a real, a, a, as it becomes in the, in the schools, you know, they're banning these new cameras in the locker rooms and all these other places. So this wireless technology is a real serious problem, and Congress needs to create a new sphere of reasonable privacy so there can be trust in a lot of situations we, where we always had trust and people are losing trust, so it's a serious problem. But there's also the, pardon me, but turn it on. Turn on your security system, keep it on, and make sure your boss turns it on. Make sure everybody in the office has uh, education about how to use that security system. Question over here. Good question. A dummy like me is never going to figure out how to put it in if it doesn't come in prepackaged. Answers? I mean, from an industry perspective, and I'm sure John can speak to what Nortel is doing, everybody out there is doing this sort of stuff. And I mean, Cisco is doing it through Linksys. Apple is doing it more and more. I mean, if you pop, you buy an Apple computer, you've got your Apple's hotspot, it works a little bit better. It tends to be a little bit easier than some other access points. You know, uh, just to get back a little bit to the security issue, you know, Security, uh, interoperability, ease of use, these are all um, things that these companies are working on right now. Juniper, which is a, a generally more of a wireline equipment manufacturer, just went out and spent $4 billion on a security company. You know, people realize these issues. From an interoperability standpoint, a company like Motorola has already uh, started to understand what getting different networks to talk to each other. So I'm not talking just Wi-Fi, but Wi-Fi, wide area, and maybe a Bluetooth, all on the same phone, all self-sensing. 
So these are developments that the handset makers are making. They're developments that the network equipment makers are making. And, um, you know, you'll see it soon. But keep in mind, I mean, what, in 2001, I think there were less than 1,000 hotspots in the U.S. I mean, I think by the end of this year, there'll be 80,000 hotspots. So it's a pretty new technology. And to expect out-of-the-box out configuration, out-of-the-box workability at this point, I think, is probably a, a little premature. Well, I mean, you're, now you're getting to the, uh, the uses of license and unlicensed spectrum and what kind of quality of service, you know, implications there are and what you can expect from networks that are, you know, these ad hoc, ad hoc networks versus networks that are controlled by wireless carriers, you know, that buy equipment from Nortel and Lucent and, and Ericsson and these guys. And, you know, when you start to, to, to think about what the carriers are doing, the carriers would prefer that their networks are the networks of choice, um, you know, uh, where the business case gets a little bit hairy is is when these other networks start popping up to challenge sort of the ubiquity and the speed and the and the um, and the functionality of these ubi uh, of these wide area networks. So to answer your question, you're probably going to have some interoperability issues with uh, with Wi-Fi networks, with these networks that are short range and which are very new uh, in, in terms of how they're being implemented from a business perspective. Let me take another policy question that comes from you that I think uh, is one of the kinds of things that you're facing. I, uh, as many of you know, on the do not call systems, uh, you, it's illegal to send an unsolicited commercial message to someone with a cell phone because the cell phone receiver has to pay for it, among other kinds of reasons. Will the business models change in this uh, so that you won't have to pay for time and perhaps change, uh, give us reason to change some of those policies? Uh, I'm not suggesting that we're all going to uh, sort of be in favor of a new kind of spam, but is the, is the business model perhaps, uh, and, is, and is regulation one of the places to help change that business model? Josh, you might have the best thought about that. Well, and, and John may want to talk a little bit about this, but as new wireless networks start to emerge, WCDMA, which is kind of the GSM flavor of 3G networks, and EVDV, which is sort of the, the next generation of CDMA networks, the networks actually become uh, a lot more efficient and allow for, um, you know, a lot more voice and a lot more data to be carried over the same networks. You know, that being said, when you get to that point, you do run into those problems. Um, as far as, you know, the business models that emerge, you know, th these applications, whether it's the Internet, whether it's the mobile Internet, you're going to have things that you don't want on your phones, and I don't know how you legislate that out. You're going to have, you know, they, they, people have had a very hard time legislating out spam, and I don't know that it happens on a, in the mobile world either. Um, it's legislated out. I don't get too many on my uh, cell phones. Actually, it works for a couple yeah. of engineering reasons as well as legal reasons. Well, Do you want to respond to it? Well, it's really uh, kind of what, getting back to in many ways, what we talked about, uh, I mentioned about uh, having a common core network that uh, uh, that allows for, you know, very efficient security policies, authentication, and all those types of things. Um, I think it's a challenge with multiple networks because then um, you, you really want to choose the best out of, uh, out of, of those features. Just, uh, just one point on, on the encryption and, and security item. An important thing is that, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, if, if you're using your systems in terms of a work environment, you really want to be using things called VPNs. So that effectively your, your messages you have several layers of security. You have layers in terms of authentication. You have layers in terms of the actual standard itself and people being able to listen in. And then you have a layer of security where, where the information that you're transmitting um, is, is encoded and then it's only decoded at, the, at your business. So security really has, uh, you, know, um, you know, we're trying to make it easier. We're trying to evolve it. But, there, but, but in many ways, it's, it's a several kind of layer thing. And all of those have to be in place. Just, just real quick to follow up, um, as far as, you know, not receiving spam on your phone, I think the, the key is yet. Mobile phones are just now, I mean, if you look at this phone here, it's got a proprietary operating system that was designed, you know, by LG or by Samsung or Motorola. What we're moving to is, is are devices that have operating systems the same way your PC has an operating system. Microsoft is playing in the operating system world now in the mobile world. 
Nokia is playing through a, a consortium called Symbian. Uh, Palm is still out there. So what you'll see, um, I, I mean, you know Microsoft uh, uh, at, at home, you know you get spam. So as these devices become more and more functional, uh, you know, as the functionality increases and email starts getting through your phones, you're going to get spam, you're going to have issues. Uh, we're, we're not looking forward to some of those, uh, but that'll give us something to do on the Hill, perhaps. Uh, let's, I, I want to go, oh, one more question in the back, then we're going to do a quick summary from each of the panelists. Somebody has to explain the question to me and the rest of the audience first, and then I'll let all three of you, or any of the three. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Why am I? Go ahead. I have a bit, WiMAX is contrasted often to Wi-Fi, that Wi-Fi is very low power, and WiMAX is a city-wide, much larger area. It addresses directly the last mile problem. I think WiMAX will be a very effective interim solution. The problem is maximum data speeds of 70 megabits per second. They're large cells. Ultimately, you're going to have to have small cells to get to these next generation broadband speeds. So it's a big improvement over what we have. And because Intel is going to put WiMAX chips in every laptop, it'll be in everything, it'll be, a, I think, a successful t technology because receipt, the availability of receivers drives the success of a standard like that. So I think it will be a very effective interim solution, but ultimately the cells are going to have to get smaller and closer and closer to the neighborhood, to, and then WiMAX doesn't really offer a compelling advantage in the real long term in, in, in that context. All right, I want to give each of the panelists a couple of minutes to give us a couple of things to make sure that we remember from this session. Uh, and uh, Josh is going to tell us what stocks to buy and sell. Who wants to go first? I'll go first so I don't get stuck at the end. Um, <laughs> just for full disclosure, uh, so we, we follow Nortel. We have a hold rating on Nortel. Um, <laughs> I won't go into the details. As I to told him he couldn't say sell. That was not oh. a, he was that was not available option. <laughs> so so, uh, uh, but you know, I think the thing to leave with uh, is kind of this broader understanding of this new mobile value chain that's created. Keep in mind that the policy decisions that you make really have ramifications all the way up and down this value chain. So you know where John is in the equipment world, clearly if. People are buying more equipment, you know, component manufacturers like Qualcomm or Texas Instruments or Intel, they all sort of get a boon. You know, at the same time, those guys, you know, are, are selling their products to carriers such as Verizon Wireless and, and Nextel and, and Singular. You know, they're also selling their products to retailers like Best Buy and Circuit City and, you know, and, and it takes all that, you know, it takes all these people in this chain to get to the end user. So when you think about things from a business perspective, You've really got to understand kind of the implications through the entire mobile value chain. Now, and, and keep in mind that these new networks, what they do is they really create this new uh, intermediate step where all these new software applications really start to develop and really start to be the platform for development. So, um, you know, the, in a lot of ways, uh, the equipment guys, the Nokias and Motorola's in the world have dominated the handset industry for a long time are really scared about the prospects of what could happen to their products because you know if you look at the PC industry where Microsoft sort of dominated it really doesn't matter whether you buy a Dell or an HP or a Compaq or something from you know uh, Best Buy whatever you buy it matters that it's running Microsoft so if phones sort of get to that point you know the Nokia's of the world wonder that you know if, if their products don't become commoditized so so I, I would just Keep in mind uh, when you when you make policy decisions that it does sort of have a ripple effect through the entire value chain. Yeah, John, uh, there's a revolution out there in radio technology. The computer and radio industries are merging, and that's changing everything in terms of possibilities for sharing spectrum. And coupled with this is an explosion in demand for spectrum which is going to require m much more efficient 
utilization of spectrum, and that can only be done in a low power context to really get the bandwidth that's necessary. That's the natural sphere for unlicensed spectrum, and unfortunately, the incumbents hate it. We're e the unlicensed folks are eating the lunch of the incumbents, the 3G people that spent all that money. They figured when you were in Starbucks or when you were at McDonald's or when you were at home and you, or wherever it was, you were going to be using their licensed networks, and they're very unhappy <laughs> and where you were going, commuting back and forth to work on your metro, that you're using unlicensed spectrum. They wanted to have, the Sears Tower, they wanted to have the singular uh, uh, in, 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 on each floor of the Sears Tower. They don't want you to have Wi-Fi. And so there's huge opposition in every proceeding at the FCC and whatnot to any unlicensed sharing. It's a real political problem. Thank you. That gives you the last word, John. Okay. So, uh... Um, definitely a world without visible wires anyway that uh, uh, you know all our devices around a house um, the devices that we use um, you know really in the future uh, in many ways the need for wires to connect all of this and all the all the interconnections in the back of the computers and all the rest and and in our lives uh, uh, you know the technology there and the enablers are there to to remove a lot of that um, we'll still, of course, have fiber connecting everything because uh, then you get huge bandwidths in the in the back of the core of the network. Um, I think it's important to remember that you know you need to use the right tool for the right job. Um, if you've got uh, a local uh, network, low power systems make a lot of sense. If you've if you want to provide coverage for people wherever they go, and and we believe people will have the same types of demands, um, then. Uh, you know, the higher power systems, much like the, the existing uh, uh, coverage area of the systems that we, we have right now. And so it's really kind of a technology on the two different fronts. And then the final thing is, is really trying to simplify the user's life. Uh, making it easy out of the box was one of the comments. Uh, uh, making our life less complicated, organizing that, and I think organizing all of our communications and uh, on the devices we want to use, or maybe just a single device in many cases, depending who you are. Um, that is a that is I think you know when we really start to see the the industry kind of take it to the next level and add a certain amount of maturity. Great, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you to the panelists, uh, Congresswoman uh, Jennifer Dunn, uh, Congressman Honda, uh, and particularly the staff of the uh, Internet Education Foundation who brought it all together and fed us lunch. Again, thanks very much for coming.